Hello, everyone, and welcome to the live stream. And I'm very excited about today's guest. And this is something that has been promised or was promised a few months back uh, when I had the opportunity to work with this specific individual on uh, American Soul Season 2. And so today, um, we have the time, considering the circumstances. And uh, so Charles German has agreed to uh, come on the channel today, and I want to give him a proper introduction. So we're going to have a chat with him and talk about the craft of being a boom up. So, um, so today I have Charles German here, who is an IATSE 695 boom operator. And Charles has been a boom op in the film industry for over 10 years. And he has worked on TV series such as The Originals, The Walking Dead, Valor, The Resident, MacGyver, and American Soul Season 2, which we recently did together to name a few. And I have learned a lot from working with Charles. And in this conversation today with Charles, we're going to be getting his take not only on booming, but what it's like to work today in the film industry, specifically the film industry uh, here in Atlanta, which has been booming for the last several years. So uh, let's go ahead and get right to uh, Charles here as I navigate this streaming software here. Charles, how are you doing today? Doing well. Thanks for having me. I want to talk a little bit about both the physical and also the mental aspects of being a boom op. And starting with the physical, I know from the conversations we have and since we are friends and work together that you have a strong passion for baseball coaching with your son's team and you also have a college athletic background. And starting with the physical aspect of being a boom op, when did it start to feel second nature to you, the physical movements of being a boom op? And, and what are the fundamental skills that, that someone needs to master? It's interesting because there, there's really no skill out there that, that, that duplicates what we do when, when we're booming. So there's, there's no real way to train those, those muscles. It's, it's your back muscles, your shoulder muscles. Uh, it's, it's a very intricate set of, of, uh, muscles that, it, that 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 are used to at boom. So, I mean, I always try to try to stay in somewhat shape when I'm not working. Yeah, you know, do do uh, uh, push ups and sit ups and stretch and you know try to try to stay flexible. That's that, that's the big thing is that our backs get very sore and very tight. So it's it's important to keep that back stretched out and limber. Um, and you know, of course, the, the the best exercise is just boom. So if you have time off, maybe go in your garage or in your driveway and just you know throw out a, a boom pole and just you know, boom your your son, or, or or boom a you know your truck, whatever you know you have, but just you know get the the uh, boom pole out there and hold on to it, um, so that you you uh, uh, stay in shape. Hopefully, you are working you know, enough that you stay fresh at work. Um, yeah, yeah. But, you know, right now with this uh, virus having us all shut down, it's it's important that we all stay in shape and, and stay you know work ready, so that when the work does come back, we're 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 ready and prepped for it. Yeah, and, and Glenn True, uh, he had sent an email back from True Audio just talking about the importance of, in the craft, those of us, you know, since we're all not working right now, of the basic things you can do, such as learning your equipment, practicing cleaning, and just really trying to expand the craft. Because, you know, sometimes if you're as blessed to stay very, very busy working all the time, you don't have the opportunity to do all that stuff. So I think that not only goes for people who are starting out, but also industry professionals. And and the second part of the question, I know I'm re-asking that question uh, because we just had a little bit of an echo. I want to make sure everyone gets the answers. How long did it take you to feel? Remember, we're going to talk about the physical and the mental aspects of booming and just the physical. How long did it take you working as a boom op in the craft to really feel like you physically had a handle on working the microphone confidently and boom pole confidently like it was second nature for you oh years it, it takes it takes years i mean when you're I, I was really 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 lucky to uh get to second boom under a uh boom operator named cole bluma in la uh still a, a good friend of mine he uh, works for buck robinson almost exclusively uh fantastic guy 
Uh, also, Craig Dollinger, who works for uh, Steve Morrow. And those guys really showed me the ins and outs of booming, and not not just the you know aim the microphone at at you know that person. They they really explained to me you know how lighting works, how to you know beat shadows, how to hide shadows, um, how to stand, your footwork, you know, your, your your hand work. It, it's it's it all all coincides to to come to a, a good boom stance or you know a good boom technique. And those two guys really, really, really were great to me and, and, and showed me how to do that. But to answer your question, I mean, it took it took years. It took you know, years and years, but that good foundation certainly helped. And then just practice, just on set practice and, and booming more and more, um, you know, really helps. And then, uh, but I mean, it took, I'd say, you know, three or four years to get really confident with swinging a, 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 a pole around. Yeah, and you know that that makes a lot of sense. And and speaking about the physical aspect, I also want to talk about the the mental aspect. And this is something that I find that most of our non-industry folks uh, or people out there have a misunderstanding about what a boom operator really does, and they're somewhat oblivious to this mental aspect. And you know, I find through my conversations with his family and friends outside of the industry is, is when the average person thinks of a boom op, they think about the physical aspect. Oh man, that must be really heavy to hold that, that pole all day or, and, and you know, what Charles are the mental aspects, you know, such as, you know, obviously memorizing dialogue, negotiating your movement on set uh, with the rest of the crew for the scene. And lastly, how do you navigate all of those relationships that you need to have on set to, to accomplish those goals. Well, start off with, with dialogue. So, you know, you know, my process, I, I like to end the morning, be left alone. Once I, once I, I have my gear on, I get my headphones on, I be my private line and then I like to go somewhere and just be left alone. Um, and then I, I normally I'm, I'm way early out of set. So it's not during the work time. I'll just go somewhere quiet and read the sides in there, you know, fully. Um, and and just just go through them, and I like to to uh, uh, read them twice. So I'm not memorizing them, but I'm I'm definitely reading them, getting them in in my brain, getting them going. And then before each scene, I'll read that scene's dialogue and really memorize it. Uh, I I feel like if it's the my second time reading it, it's not my first time seeing it. It makes memorizing it a lot easier. Um, so I, I that's how I do it. I, I'm not saying that's that that's the right way or the wrong way, but that's my way. Um, I think if, if you're reading a, a scene for, for the first time, as we're about to shoot it, you're just not set up to do well. Uh, it's just it's way too hard to uh, to uh, learn that dialogue in that short of time. Um, so that's how I do it. Um, now, in dealing with the mental aspect, um, you know, again, it's, it's just creating friendships on set and uh, making sure that, that you can work with all the, all the people on set, you you won't be uh, friends with all. Of them. It's just it's not going to happen. You're going to have you know uh, uh, personalities that just don't match yours. Um, you're going to have egos that don't match yours, and that's that's part of it. And you have to to uh, see that and know that, and find a way to navigate through those. Um, so you know you have to you have to see. Let's just say you have a, a key grip that's that's you know kind of a bully. It's kind of tough, you know. You have, you have to uh, uh, see that day one, day two, and, and realize that he's he's a you know a tougher you know you know guy. He's he's hard to uh, to uh, uh, work with or to deal with. So you have to really earn that guy's respect, so that when you ask for for something, um, he knows that it's 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 truly needed. Don't ask for a, a, a flag every single scene on the first day. Don't ask for a uh, a you know ladder and, and then not use it. You just don't don't. Don't add work onto those guys' workload if it's not absolutely necessary. That way, when you do ask you know, for, for, for something, they know that you actually need it. It's not just a, a wish. You know what I mean? Um, so it's, it's just navigating the uh, set and you know, making friendships and finding time when you're not you're memorizing dialogue or working to chit-chat with certain people just to, just to get on that personal level so that it's, it's not always work talk um, so that they, they, uh, they can know you at, at – you know, just as a person, and I find that makes it easier to um, get work done and get things that we need for good sound. Yeah, and and I have the utmost 
respect for Boom Ops working on set and especially, you know, working with you, Charles, and the fact that the Boom Operator just has, is really the face of the department on set. And they are navigating all of those relationships on top of trying to do their job. Because, you know, a lot of the times, as we know, working on set, this is a visual world. Everyone is looking at the frame. The DP is focused on the lighting. And there's so much emphasis on that. And one of the things that I like that you said and that you mentioned is not over asking and thinking about the long game. And speaking of the long game, who, who are the key for those of us uh, here watching who may be newer uh, to the craft or just starting out? Who, who are the key players? What are the key relationships that you're focusing on or that you have to work with on a daily basis on set that you're having to communicate to get what you need it is to do your job? So that's, that's a two-part question. So before we we shoot a scene, when we're, when we're, when we're setting up, you've got to work with the DP, with the gaffer, with the key grip. Those are the guys that are, are, are going to sculpt the, the lighting and, and, and you know, either make you have a very, very hard time doing the AS scene or, or make it very easy for you. Uh, so you, you, you need to watch them as they add lights. You need to have a, a boom pole out there to, to find shadows, to, to uh, you know, find ways to hide shadows, uh, find a spot to, to a stand that might not be, you know, shadowing, um, and so forth. Um, you know, during the, the, the uh, scenes, you have to work with the dolly grips and the camera operators very, very closely. Uh, you know, there's, there's a lot of times where we have to cross dolly track or, you know, if it's, you know, if, if the scene is flowing and, and moving, you might have to cross the, you know, dolly track mid scene. Uh, if you're doing that, you need to have that worked out with the dolly grip. So, A, there's not a, you know, uh, uh, collision. You know, that's, that's always not good. Uh, and, B, you want to make sure that he knows you're doing that so it, it, it doesn't throw him off. Uh, camera operators, obviously, you have to work with, you know, very, very closely. You got to know what they're going to do in a, in a shot, what they're, how they're going to shoot it, if they're going to tilt up at some point, if they're going to tilt down at some point. If they're going to pan left, if they're going to go for a insert, if they're going to go for a handshake, if they're going to go for a hug, you know, whatever they're, they're, going to, they're going to do in a shot, you need to know about it um, so you can avoid shadowing or being in the shot. Um, if you don't know exactly what they're going to do, there is no way you can be successful. Yeah, and, you know, and that's a perfect segue, Charles, and what you're saying into the relationship that you also have within your own department and how it is that we work together. And, you know, speaking of working with mixers, um, you know, when we worked together, I felt like most of our communication was second natured. And I really had to think about that a lot because you were one of definitely the smoothest boom ops that I've ever worked with. And it's like we knew what each other were thinking. And, and it took really very little for us to be in sync uh, on each setup on what was going to work with the mix. And, and a lot of the times we, we had fun with that. It was almost like this, this game of aces. And I really enjoyed that process with you. And, and my question is, is obviously you've worked with a host of mixers. We've done one television show together. Um, and how do you navigate the, the working relationship with the different mixers that you work with who may have different styles and approaches. Well, every mixture is different. Everyone has their their way of doing things and and, and their way of, of speaking about a scene or or or, or getting a scene worked out. Uh, the way I, I always go into a scene is that if uh, mm -hmm. if I don't I don't tell you or ask you to to play a wire, it's just known that it's on the boom. Um, some mixtures don't like that. Some mixtures want to go you know line for line and say, hey, is this on the boom or wire? And if if you know that's their on their uh, workflow, that's fine too. Um, I I find it easier just if we don't say it, that a certain line or a certain word or a certain part of a line is on a wire, it's assumed that it's on the boom. Uh, that being said, you better be be uh, confident and sure that if you don't say something, you, you it's on the boom because you're gonna make you know you, you know your your mixer and yourself look real silly if you don't tell them to uh, uh, play a line on a wire and they don't and you don't boom it. We don't have it. 
So it's just it's it's just a deal where you and your uh, mixture have to be on the, the same page, and the way that you guys get there is your business. Um, yeah, that your your you know, formula and, and your process to get on that same page. Um, that's that's up to you guys. Um, you know, my my favorite way to do it is again, if I don't tell you, it's not on the boom. It's it's on the boom, and I find that's that's the easiest and smoothest way to do it. Yeah, and and as as you know, in in us working together, you know, and I'm sure I speak not only for myself but a lot of mixers, how important it is to have a solid and cohesive mix, and how much of that relationship and skill level t- working together, that symbiotic relationship with the boom op is to actually accomplishing that goal. And, you know, because there's a lot of talk and you'll see online, well, they're, they're not going to use the mix. That's going to be used, you know, the ISOs and yeah. they're going to recreate all that and all that kind of stuff. But the truth <clears throat> is that everything we do on set and is seems to be judged by the production mix. It's all the producers are listening to it, the directors listening to it, and the dailies mm-hmm. going to the network and or the executives. Every day is your production mix. So to be able to be on the same page and to have that communication is just critical. So thank you for input on that. Um, so, you know, so one of the purposes of this channel, Charles, is to learn and educate those who are upcoming in the field. And, um, what advice would you give to the newer boom up who is just starting to get opportunities working on shows, tier ones, low budget shows, and union type productions? I'll tell you to get out of the business now. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Um, I, would, <laughs> I would say, uh, you know, really, really pay attention to your uh, mixers, listen to them, um, you know, pick their brains. Uh, and don't get too cocky too early. Uh, you know, we see a lot of it that, that the mixers are in that, you know, boom guys just think they're, they're there and they have no more learning, you know, to, to do. Uh, and that's just not the case. Uh, you know, we're, we're all still learning every day. Um, so just, just keep learning, uh, keep, keep asking questions, keep practicing. Um, and when you mess up, learn from it, own it, say, Hey, I, I, I messed up, learn from it, move on. Um, and just, just, you know, keep digging, um, pick your mixers wisely. You know, um, uh, if, if, if you feel like a mixer can't teach you anything or you guys are, are not on the, the uh, same page, find somebody else, um, you know, work with guys that, that, that challenge you and that, uh, can help educate you. That's, that's really excellent feedback, Charles. And, 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 Let's talk and, and move a little bit about some of the things that I noticed uh, specifically about working with you on set on how it is that you operate from some technical aspects. And one of the things that we had spoken about that I noticed that you do differently than the other boom ops that I had worked with is your headset. And I noticed and we noticed that you actually have a customized set of headphones which actually only one ear set is on and that the other one is off share with us why you choose to do this and listen with one ear set and what the benefits are for you working on set so not really customized it's it's this pair actually you just take off the uh the cuff the cuff off of there and then just unplug it and tape it close um and i wear it like this um because I like to be able to hear um, both the set and my microphone or 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 the mix. Uh, I feel like you 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 lose kind of your spatial awareness when you have both headphones on. You, you're 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 kind of just locked into that microphone world, and you're not really hearing the real world that's that's that surrounds you. You don't hear a a you know, dolly grip whisper something very quietly to you or to a you know camera operator. Um, there's times where a, a, you know, a camera operator might tap his foot, you know, just, just you know, just get you t- to glance over there. When you do, he might be telling you, Hey, I'm, I'm going to tilt up. I'm going to tilt down. I'm going to go for, for a insert. I'm doing something different from our plan. Um, plus I, I just feel like when you're moving around a, a set quickly and, and, and rapidly, uh, I just don't feel as comfortable when I'm wearing both headphones. So I uh, I wear one 
it it, it works for me. Um, I've had mixers say it's crazy and they think it's it's a bad idea. Um, you know, I've I've had you know guys just to just say that's 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 bad, bad technique, and it may be, but it it really works for what I do. It works for how I I I boom operate. Um, so I like doing it, and uh, if you want to try it, it's 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 pretty neat. It, I feel like it, it it just gives you a better feel of the set and your surroundings. Yeah, and 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 speak, speaking of specific workflows, talk about typically like when we were working together on American Soul season two. You know that I always like to uh, attend rehearsals. Uh, when, of course, uh, all of the crew is welcome to that rehearsal uh, for these first team rehearsals. And obviously you are always there. Um, and tell me what the things as a boom op that you are looking for and listening to, et cetera, during rehearsals. So you got to listen for for numerous things and, and, and watch for you know, numerous things. I have kind of a code on my sides that you've seen before. I, I, I have little symbols that I'll write on there that, that mean certain things. Uh, if I, if I draw, you know, a little, this kind of shape, uh, on the right side of, of, of two lines that tells me that was a overlap. So I need to tell my, uh, my mixer, Hey, on this line, they overlap. So you, you know, you need to help me out on, on a, a wire. Or when you pick a line that I'll play on, on the boom and you pick one to, to play on the wire. So we get both those lines. Um, you always listen for, you know, loud footsteps, loud, loud shoes, um, things that, that make noise, you know, uh, during a scene that we can you know, either ask the actor to do off dialogue or we can ask props if they have a quieter version, uh, if it's keys or maybe a, a plastic bag they're carrying groceries in or you know, whatever it, it, it might be that makes noise. We, we want to learn that up front, not during take one. We want to learn that up front and say, hey, is there a way we can substitute that bag for maybe a cloth bag or something else that's not so, so noisy? Um, and then you're always, you're always watching practical lights um, on Seoul. You know, we had a lot of practical lights, obviously. So there was times where I would see they're, they're on land right, right underneath of a park-in, which we had park-ins all over that, that set that, that set had. 50 parkings, 40, a bunch. Uh, so there'll be times where I, I would ask the DP in the marketing rehearsal, hey, will it change your, your your shot if we move them a foot or two to the left or to the right? And most times he'd say, yeah, he'd, he'd say, yeah it's, it's fine with me. I, I, yeah, I don't care. So we just move those uh, marks a foot or two to the right, and then we have no shadows. So you're just, you're just looking for things that, that are going to stop you from booming. And then you're going to step back and think about ways to fix that problem or problems so that you can boom the shot. And then you're going to find things that are noisy, make them not noisy, um, so that when you're booming, you have a nice, quiet, good track. Those are really, really great answers, Charles, and I appreciate you sharing that. And speaking of a, a workflow and being on set, how is it um, that... Well, here, let me come to that in just a second. Let me, let me first ask more of a simple question. What, what kind of boom pole do you typically like to use? Is it, you know, do you have a preference as far as uh, standard lengths uh, or, you know, models, manufacturers? Look, you, you know me. I am the least technical guy you'll meet in, in the sound business. Um, I have a, a, a K-Tech Classic. I have, I have three of them. I love them. Um, ask me the model number. I couldn't tell you. Um, they're 18 feet. I have a 16 and two 18 footers. Um, I love them. Uh, I've, I've tried most of them out there. Um, and I, I just always come back to the old okay tech. It's just, it's just what I started with. It's what I got used to. Um, I think they're light. I like the way they flex. I feel like that flex, um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, it, it, it lets the microphone kind of in the pole kind of move a little bit when you're doing a, a long walk and talk or, or a run and talk if you will, or, or, or a fast moving scene and that kind of eats up some of that body movement as opposed to it just, just being transferred straight to the microphone. So I'm a K tech guy. Uh, I'm not endorsing them in any way. I'm just saying that's, that's, that, that and that's my pick. Um, well, there's a lot of good polls out there. There's, there's a lot of good ones. You know, and, and another question as far as like tech is concerned, Charles, um, obviously the system that we were using 
is, you know, uh, the sound device is MM1 with electro transmitter. And I've had boom ops that I've worked with in the past say, oh, that's, that's too heavy. Don't you have an HM? And, you know, I'm curious. Uh, I have my reasons for using that system. Uh, one of which is it's the tech that I have. Two is that it has a much better sounding limiter, I think, and dynamic range than using the HM. And then also another thing that we use on set together is comm systems, meaning that you're able to talk to me privately without having to request a PL. And also the sound utility is also in on those conversations. Talk to me about what your preference is. If you had to choose uh, what sort of, uh, obviously I think most 99% of people are wireless these days for their boom rigs. Are there any systems that you prefer technically and what are your thoughts on using comm systems within a crew so i i mean for ease of booming i like like the a10s or the hms because they're they're it makes your your boom pole totally wireless uh so that there's 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 no tether to your hip or to a hard line back to the car you're totally wireless so your your range of motion is is limitless you can do anything you want, whenever you want. Uh, you don't. You don't worry about you know a a coily cable going to your hip, getting caught on a dolly, or getting caught on furniture, or you know whatever. Um, but that being said, if you have them in one and a pack on your hip, it makes the uh, the uh, the pole much lighter. So yeah, it, it there's there's positives to both styles. Um, if I had my druthers and had my choice, it'd be an A10 or a HM. Yeah. But I think I think sound wise, I I mean I think you're right that that uh, you know MM1 does sound better than HM. Well, I know you know a lot of mixers, boom ops. I have moved to this A10 system, and I think the advantages of digital sonically are pretty amazing. I mean, I've been on set visiting with other departments who are using this system and Mixer says, hey, you know, put on these headphones, let you hear this. And I've been in awe about the sound of it. Um, so, you know, it, working with digital and bringing more digital into my workflow is something that I'm definitely uh, considering. I was actually really looking forward to NAB this year to see what might come new in the digital because I'm sure I'm hoping we'll see something with a plug-on from uh, Electrosonics very soon in a digital setup, just because, you know, uh, you know, just having things that kind of work with the stuff I already have is important to me. So, um, so yeah, so as far as I'd, I'd like to move to uh, like a Q&A, we've got a few people here with us and some different questions that I'd like to uh, put on here. And then for this, I'll just go to a quick split screen mode. And thank you everyone for uh, being here. And now is an excellent time. If you have questions for Charles, uh, just about booming or his background or anything like that, let's go ahead and get those out there now. And I'm gonna scroll through the chat here. Uh, you know, first say uh, the, the Alejandro, hey Michael, hey Charles. Alejandro uh, has been an excellent supporter to this channel. Alejandro, thank you for saying hello. It's great to see you here. Um, and then, okay, so um, so this is when we were having the, uh, what is it, the uh, feedback issue from you or the delay, which was my fault, by the way, <laughs> not Charles. And uh, the question is from Aiden Nazarat says, hello all. Uh, were you doing sound before you were in the union? A question for you, Charles. Uh, I was for, for a little while. I, I started off doing non-union work. Uh, like I said, in, in California, you, you, you can't just walk up to the union hall and pay your money and join. Uh, you have to have qualified days. Um, out there, it was 100 paid non-union days was your qualification to join the local. So I, I had to work non-union to, to get... Get, you know, just get my days and, and learn the craft prior to joining. Yeah, and and thank you for answering that, Charles. That's a great question. And um, thank you, Aiden. So uh, good morning, afternoon. Uh, all right, now we have all the echo comments, so let's get through that here. Um, okay, great. So uh, Aiden also says, I came a little late into the stream, assuming Charles is exclusively a boom op. 
What gear does he own besides a boom and headphones? Do you use your own microphones, Charles? I do not. Um, so generally the, the workflow for that is that the mixer has, has all the gear. I do have boom poles and my headphones, obviously. And I own, I own you know, a, few, uh, a few little knickknacks. I have, I have a slate. Um, that I I was trying to get on as a third slate onto a show if or or a fourth slate if the show uh, uh, mandates that. But in that I I leave the gear up to the uh, mixer, use what they have. Okay, great, very very good. So, um, all right, everyone congratulating us on uh, the no echo here, ten count. Okay, great. So Adam uh, BD says kindly I have two questions. Do you use often wireless boom pole? As a boom operator, should I take a risk to be near the limit of the frame all the time with my mic? Great question, Adam. Oh, so a frame line is is you know where you can't go. Um, outside of the frame is your choice, obviously, and, and, and your ears have to to dictate that. If you have uh, you know a guy shouting at the top of, of his lungs and the frame is like this. You don't want to be on the the uh, frame line. You're gonna you're gonna blow out the uh, microphone, and you're gonna hit the limiters. It'll sound terrible. So at that point, you might be you know four feet away from them, and that might sound the best. Uh, that's where it's it's key to use your ears, and and you know your mixer has to uh, talk to you if you're hitting limiters or it, you know it's too loud. You might have, you might need to to uh, back down on your transmitter, um, or get farther away, add add more space or more air, as we call it. Um, so no, you don't always have to ride a, a, a frame line. Uh, when it's normal speaking dialogue, I do like to be as close as possible. Uh, but there's certain microphones. There's there's times with you know, let's say that a uh, mixer that you work for only has shotgun mics. A uh, shotgun mic doesn't sound that great right here. It might sound better, you know, up here. So you you know there's the, there's the general rule, the most important rule of doing this this job is use your ears. If it doesn't sound right, fix it. Change something. Find something else. Um, so that's that's a, a good question. But uh, no, you don't always have to ride the uh, frame line. You have to do what sounds best. Yeah, and Adam brings up a really excellent question. And to add to that, Charles, is um, how are you finding these frame lines? Is Are you typically coordinating with the mixers? Or what other techniques do you use to actually figure out where those frame lines are going to be? So that's that's something you need to work out with the, the, uh, the camera operators. Uh, I, you know, the mixer has, has plenty on you know, his plate or her plate, um, you know, get, getting, getting their, their sides cut up, getting their cues all lined up, getting, you know, they're, uh, you know, they're busy. Um, so I, I generally don't like to ask them for a frame line if I don't have to. That's something you need to work out with the camera operators on set. Okay, great. Really great question. Thank you, Adam. Okay. So, uh, moving right along here, uh, Alejandro asks, what are you guys using for plug-in or plug-on transmitters? So Mike Lynn uses the Santa MM1 with a Coley cable to my cabled boom pole. Um, but, you know, there's, I've worked with many mixtures, and it's, it's a wide range from A10s to HMAs to HMs to MM1s. Uh, so it's, it's all across the board. Yeah, great question, Alejandro. Thank you for asking. Um, something, okay. And I'm not sure about what this product is, but, uh, Alejandro asked question for Charles as a boom up. Have you found the need to use the X something product that Ken strain is using? Oh, so it's, it's the exoskeleton. Yeah, it's, ah. it's, I'm not sure of the name of it, but it's, it's a, it's a, basically it's similar to a, a steady cam rig for boom operators. It's, it's, it's a brace system. I have not used it. Um, I've, I've done some, some fairly long takes, and I've never felt the need to uh, uh, use one. Um, but um, no, I've I've not used it. And I have not found the need to use one. Okay, great. You know, I'd imagine that this particular system is just a matter of trying to save. You know, um, I guess you know someone's back or something like that from strain. And you know, it it reminds me, Charles, of uh, these easy rigs that we see showing up on set yeah. uh, that are creating <laughs> that, you know, we have a lot of humor about the, you know, just, I mean, you know, we obviously know why they're being used and, uh, but 
they're they're quite an obstacle. Explain to everyone what these easy rigs are and, and what kind of challenges that makes for you as a boom op. So I'm I'm six foot one, which which is a big advantage in my opinion to get over people with with a, a, a boom pole. If I'm like this with a boom, I can swing over the, uh, the head of uh, camera operators, no problem. So if we're in a scene and you know they're handheld, there's you know two of them and one of me. I'm 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 like, I'm trying to swing back and forth. It's very easy to uh, do so without a easy rig. The easy rig is a big old pole that goes on the back of a camera operator comes over and down to hold the weight of the camera. Now that turns a six foot tall camera operator into a seven foot tall Goliath that is very hard to swing your boom pole over. So there's there's times you just can't swing over and you're just not tall enough. And you can't be on a, a, a ladder because you have to move your, your feet also. So the, the easy rig is definitely uh, a good product for camera operators. It, it, it saves their uh, back and shoulder, but it is uh, not my favorite uh, tool <laughs> to boom with. Yeah. And, and, you know, and, and a lot of the times, you know, one of the things I think that saved us, Charles, you know, in, in working on the show is just really humor and having fun and sometimes laughing you know, at these situations that we run into and these challenges. And there's some good questions coming up here about how are you dealing with situations? So let's, let's uh, move to that. Now, here's something uh, that I'm not sure uh, from Jeff Cools. Hello, Jeff Cools. So he says, how does your work change when doing reality television production? Never done it. Couldn't tell you. I, I've, I've only done scripted dialogue and scripted uh, uh, TV shows. I've, I've never stepped foot into the world of reality TV. So I'm, I'm not a good resource for that uh, type question. Yeah, I know. I mean, I sh- I'm with you there too, Charles. I don't have any experience in the reality realm, but from what I understand, it's mostly wires. Do they boom for reality TV or? Yeah, I, th- I think the, uh, okay. the uh, mixer booms. The you know, it's, it's a, it's a one man band type dude. I okay. think it's, it's mostly, you know, you're you're uh, booming the stuff you can, but yeah, it's mostly wires, is my yeah. understanding. And I know we have quite a few uh, newer sound utilities also in our market here in Atlanta who have worked in that world a little bit as well. So it at least gives them some wiring experience, you know. But I think from a workflow standpoint, it is pretty very much different. Sure, sure. Uh, thank you, Jeff. So um, okay, Jeff Cools also asks here. A uh, is your boom coil coiled inside or outside? Inside. Mine are okay. all internally cabled. Okay. I and have I have I have pass through cables, which is one straight cable that I goes through that then plugs into the transmitter, and then I have a coily cable, which is um, it's a you know long coily cable inside of, of the pole that uh, that that way you can uh, you can operate the uh, pole faster when you have to you know mm-hmm. pull it in and out. Mm-hmm. Okay, great. Thank you, Jeff, for the question. Um, oh, so Blake Beard has a question here. Hey, Blake, good to see you. Uh, for you, Charles, he says, what mic preferences do you have for indoor and outdoor? So I am a huge fan of the 50, um, the MKH 50s. It's, 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 in my opinion, the best sounding mic for dialogue inside. I love it. Um, so you know, there's, there's chefs, guys, there's yeah, you know, DPA guy. I am uh, a, a big fan of the 50 mm-hmm. and the 8050. Uh, also, is a is a you know great mic. Outside, uh, I think I'm gonna I'm gonna make some make some folks mad here, but I do not like the uh, CMIT. It, mm-hmm. it, it's not my first choice. It sounds good, but I just don't think it it sounds great. Which I made uh, you uh, use like for four months straight. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, 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 <laughs> and you never it's, complained. <laughs> no, it's, I mean, it, yeah, it's fine. Um, but yeah, I mean, outdoors, it, you know, just, it just depends on yeah. what we're doing really. Uh, I'm, I'm a big fan of the 8060. I think it, it, it sounds really nice. Is that your preference for, now you also said that you had liked the Sankin CS3E as well for exteriors, I believe. Yeah, it's told, neat. Yeah. It's, it's, it's definitely a problem solver. I mean, it, it's yeah. not, you know, it's definitely not a mic that I would use all day, every day. Yeah. It, it certainly has its, its, its place. It, it really hides background noise really well. Yeah, uh, and it's got it's got a lot of pull. Uh, my uh, friend Mike Schmidt, who's a, a mixer, also yep. has them, yep. loves them, um, and we've 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 done some pretty incredible things with the uh, uh, CS3. Now, so Mike, now now you said uh, the eighty sixty. 
uh, was your preference for exteriors. And you had talked, like- you talked a lot about that uh, to me. I remember saying, Michael, you got to try this. And I really want to. Yeah, I, I, I like a lot. I first used it with uh, Bud Raymond actually has them. Um, mm-hmm. And they, they, they just sound really natural and really clean. They got, they got good, good reach. Uh, and they sound really natural and clean on wow. my ears. Yeah, that's great. Thank you, Blake, for the uh, the question about mic preferences. It's it's I like you know I don't always listen uh, to everyone's mic preferences, but I like hearing them. And and Charles, you are one of those guys that when you recommend a mic, I listen. So I appreciate that. You know. Um, okay. So next question: uh, What do you think are the must-have skills to be a professional boom operator? And I'm glad he asked this question because this was when we were having the echo thing and. You know, sure. Yeah, I think, I think the biggest thing is you got to be personable on set. You got you got to be able to find a way to get along with people that, that you might not like. Um, the fact is, you're you're gonna work with eighty people, ninety people, hundred people every day, and odds are, just by the numbers, you're not gonna love every person on set. It's just that's just the nature of it. Uh, you got to find a way to to uh, get along with them and to interact with them in a civil way. And in a way that you can get your your uh, job done and get the best sound possible. Uh, and then there's always the you know physical side. Of it. You got to be strong enough or able to hold a a you know, boom pole up for 10, 20 minutes at a time. There's there's takes. You know you might go, you know, ten minutes, tw- you know, twelve minute takes. And if if you just can't physically do that, you're gonna have a very hard time booming. If you, you know, if, if you're just not strong enough, you're just not strong enough. Yeah. Great question. Thank you, Yayo, uh, for that question. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. Um, oh, look here. Mr. Matt Aston. Hello, Matt. Thanks for tuning in. He said, I set a reminder for this live video and it failed to remind me. <laughs> Bummer. Hey, Michael. Hey, Charles. Hey, everybody else. Hey, Matt. Thanks for being here. Uh, another local pro in our community. Uh, Hello, Matt. I've, I've worked with Matt and he's just a pleasure to work with and brings a lot of excellent energy to set. Uh, okay, Jeff Cools. Uh, I like this question, Charles. And that question is, have you ever been in a position where the boom could not be used? Oh, absolutely. And there's, there's times where just, uh, you know, lighting is such that you just can't boom a shot. And uh, you, have, you have to go to your, your uh, mixer and, and just tell them, hey, I, I can't boom this. Um, and it's going to be on, on wires and it's just stuff. Uh, that's just part of it. You know, there's, there's just times where we have to use wires. I hate it. Uh, but that's, that's just, that's just part of the job. Yeah. Great, great question, Jeff. And I mean, and I think this also speaks to kind of just the coordination of any scene that we work with. I mean, the truth is, is you're going to have a wide master to start and it's probably not going to be boomable. Um, if that headroom is, you know, we're talking six to eight feet and it's a big old wide, then, you know, we're going to be starting on the wires. And the expectation is in uh, on a uh, larger scale television show or film is that that production mix sounds natural and, um, you know, excellent. And then there might be situations where you have off camera dialogue that uh, it's going to make more sense to keep the boom on what we're focusing on, where it might be too much of a swing. And then you you miss an opportunity of a breath or something like that, that they need. So there's definitely situations where it's a balance of both. So really, really great question there, Jeff. So, uh, so here we got here, Matt Aston, Charles, Michael, here we go, Matt. When looking for a utility to second boom, what are the tips you can give them when they're shifting from utility mode to boom mode on the fly? Great question, Matt. Yeah, that's as perfect. The main thing is to be ready. Be ready every minute that you're on set because uh, you know if if one flag or one light changes, that might change from one boom to a, to a two in a matter of seconds. Uh, I and it happens. I as as boom operator don't have time to tell you the the sequence of of the scene or the dialogue or to you know teach you the dialogue or the movement. So you really have got to pay attention to every rehearsal. Um, you know, you're, you're, you're busy wiring and, and, and stuff done, but you need to, you know, poke in once in a while and check out lighting and check out the marks and see where actors, you know, are, are, are moving to. So if you're called in, you know, on the fly, you, you have the dialogue memorized and you can step in and function on very short notice. 
And, and Charles really makes some excellent points there, Matt, and that's a really good question because it, it touches on how often do we use two booms, Charles, on a, on a set? Oh, a lot. A good, a, a good bit of the time. And, and typically the boom operator is, and when we work together, is the one making those calls. Uh, you know, I mean, I think, you know, you have more, I, you know, you see things that I don't see as a mixer. You know, I can see the framing. I'm working back, trying to make sure we have everything we need and everything's coordinated and pointing out any sounds or anything we need to get quiet and that sort of stuff. But you're seeing the opportunities that the mixer may not see. Correct. And I mean, the, the, the goal is, is to get every line of dialogue on a boom. That's, that's my goal. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, so I'm, I'm a big, big proponent of, you know, second booms and, uh, you know, the guys that have worked with me know that, uh, I, I'm not afraid to call in, uh, for a, a, a second boom on short notice. Yeah. And, and, you know, uh, I, I, you make a really excellent point as far as like second boom and utility, as far as having the, uh, you know, the transmitter ready, the cabling ready, everything ready to go where you can just grab it and run the set. So as soon as the, uh, you call in that second boom, it's just moments away. And then also, I really like the point that you bring up about paying attention to what's going on in the scene. You know, what, what specifically are we shooting? What's the blocking? So when you go there, you have a sense of the dialogue. And I think that's why when these IFB systems and everyone hearing the mix and being on the same page uh, is really helpful to that. Thank you, Matt, for that question. Great question. Uh, Just a heads up, my, my son is on his way here with a friend, oh, so okay, it get a little noisy. Yeah, no problem at all. And actually, we probably just have a few more questions, and then we'll think about uh, closing this out in respect of your time and everyone's time, Charles. No, no, uh, that's fine. So, all right, so, all right, so Jeff Cools asks, would you ever consider wearing small uh, drywall stilts uh, on set? Uh, interesting question, but no, I, I would not. I think that's that's a safety issue, and I don't think that uh, I don't think that the safety guidelines would let us do that. But if they if they would, I I certainly would not do that. Okay, great. Thank you for asking that question, Jeff. And uh, so Edgar asks, uh, what do you feel when three cameras work together at the same time and the boom can't work properly? And I think what he's speaking to Charles is wide and tights getting coverage while having sure. other cameras going yeah i don't i don't like it and what what i what i try to do is you know be laid back about it let them let them let them work through it um go to the uh uh dp as early as possible and say hey if this if this shot doesn't work on wires can we shut down that wide camera once you're happy with it and get a take or two with just the tighter cameras mm-hmm. uh, so that way you know if 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 the wires don't sound flawless i want to get it on the boom yeah, uh, and, and you, know, you, 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 I mean, you might have to ask the DP if he'll shut down a a, a camera, so that you can get that. Uh, if they say no, that's their choice, and and you can't fight that. There, there there's no point to argue it. Yep. There's no point to hassle them. Is it? Mm-hmm. If it's a no, it's it's a no, and you tell your 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 mixer, hey, they're not going to do it. Uh, mm-hmm. We're have to be satisfied, with, you know, the wires. And at, at that point, it puts a lot of weight on the utility because those mm-hmm. wires have got to sound great. Those yeah. wires have to sound flawless, because that's our only source of sound for the scene. So, yeah. you know, hopefully, it doesn't come to that. But if it does, that's that's my approach. Yeah, that's that's great info, Charles. And you're absolutely right. The the you know the utility also has probably one of the hardest jobs on a film set. And you know, in our market, most of the utilities are doing the wiring, and it's critical that they sound great and uh, cause you just never know when you are going to get that three camera set up. So that's a great question, Edgar. So uh, Aiden asked, what's your longest take, Charles? Longest take. Um, hmm. I don't know. We, we did some pretty long ones. Um, I filled in a little bit on community. Um, but we did some pretty, pretty long ones there. They're, you know, 15, 20 minute takes well, that show was, was, was pretty long. Uh, uh, Parks and Rec, which I filled in on, also had some pretty long takes as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah. They, you know, some of these directors, they like to just keep rolling and just, you know, resetting, going again, right? You know, and. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So thank you. Great question there, Aiden. Uh, okay. Uh, Alejandro says On the topic of reality, I'm a one person band, often in reality, and depending on the budget, it's mostly wires they rely on. 
Thank you, Alejandro, for that input. That's great, because Charles and I were definitely trying to figure that out. Um, okay. Uh, here we go. So ATA A18 is this username here. Question from Bulgaria. Plug on versus cable, Charles. What about cabled booms? Well, so a hardwired boom always sounds better. Has mm -hmm. has more range. Uh, it's it's cleaner. Always sounds better, uh, no doubt. But in in the, the the modern workflow now, the sound cards are generally farther away from uh, from set, uh, which means more and more cable. And uh, the you, you know uh, cable person or your third is just busy with other things. So it it makes it not as feasible as it used to be. Um, and the, the uh, wireless has come so far, it certainly sounds very, very close to a, a cable boom. Especially uh, in digital, especially with the A10 mm -hmm. and, and some of the new technologies that we're seeing, I think is really going to help a lot. Great question, uh, ATA18. But, yeah, but, but, but for like really loud scenes or, or, or scenes mm -hmm. with, with, with big you know, dynamic range, I still like to use a, a cable boom. Yep. I, I've done scenes to where we had you know, two, three talent go back to base camp with transmitters and the RF be so bad, we had to through, you know, throw out two 100 foot lines to go cabled. Just, you know, in the moment's notice, you never know. You just sure. have to do what you need to do and it will always sound excellent. Nothing sounds better than cable. <laughs> you know, uh, so Adam BD says, for documentary, the second CS3E is a very good choice outside. Another question, do you try to take care of your back, Charles? I do, yeah. I, I I try to stretch each each morning, each night. I try I I try to stretch a lot. I find that stretching really really helps with the uh, the back. Yeah. Thank you, Adam. Great question. And just kind of moving through these here, out of respect for Charles' time. So, uh, alarm clock film says tips for starting out in pro audio, getting sound utility gigs, any good places you can look for jobs in L.A. Uh, I have not been in California in you know, five in five years now. So I'm, I'm not a, a good source for that question, but finding jobs is all about networking. It's, it's, it's all about meeting people and, and knowing people. Um, you can always check with, with your, your union hall. If you're in a, a union, uh, if you're not, um, you know, I would, I would find jobs everywhere on, uh, I mean, you know, on, on, on Craigslist, I found a, uh, not even job one time. So just, it's just all about networking, find sound people and, Asked to meet more of their sound friends and just meet more and more uh, sound people. And and one one thing I want to add to that too, uh, Alarm Clock Films, and what uh, you're saying, Charles, is you know find a mentor and be clear with them that you're not looking for a job. You're not trying. You you if if you if your intention is to learn and grow, I find that people are very receptive to that. Um, so Blake Beard asked. Uh, what about techniques for hiding shadows, Charles? Well, it's just you had to you had to learn how lighting works and how you know how the light is, is being sculpted by the grips with with flags and with you know cutters and teasers and and so on. Uh, but you know if 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 you have a shadow on this cabinet right here, it's right there. You know what I mean? You're gonna, you're gonna see that obviously. But if you have a shadow right here where my my eye pen is now. That's no problem. So if you can find a way to put a shadow off this cabinet and put it and put it over here, that's totally fine. So shadows are going to happen. That's, that's that's nature. You're going to have shadows. The key is just learning how to hide them and have them off frame, um, so that so that it's not seen. That's all. Yeah. Thank you, Charles. Yeah. So Norm Claire asks, Michael Wynn. Hey guys, any thoughts on the benefit of built-in uh, recorders and the transmitter like the ones available with Zaxcom system? Yeah, I've I've uh, worked with um, with James Mace is is a big Zatchcom guy. He's a great guy. He's a great mixer. Uh, he's fully Zatchcom, and there there are times where you know it was very neat and very useful. Um, you know, we had we had a scene that was does in a van, and the van was meant to stay within about 20, 30 yards of us. Uh, they kept going. The scene just kept going. It kind of evolved, and the, and then they ad libbed, and you know the van got farther away, and uh, we lost range. But his Zatchcom was you know, running and uh, we got along. So it, it, it definitely helped there. That's incredible. Yeah. Great question. Thank you, Norm Claire. Um, so Adam BD asks, 
Jeff Cools for, well, he makes comment. Jeff Cools, for example, during a shot where the cameras use like a surveillance camera, 14 millimeter in the upper corner of the room. So he was commenting on the three camera setup and just some of the difficulties we'll run into with that. And then so Alejandro says, Charles, when a 100 paid non-union day requisite, speaking of the 695 requisite Mm -hmm. to join the union, does this include shorts and features or just simply features? Uh, I, I believe it's 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 all days. It, you know, it has to be a paid day with with a, a call sheet. But please do not quote me on on, on yeah. that. I uh, I would call six ninety five. That's and, right. And ask them. I believe it was you know a, a paid day with a matching call sheet. Yeah, that's great. So it looks like we have one last question, Charles, and um, and then we're going to close this up. And man, I'm so grateful for your time. And I think this sure. is just really some amazing info to be able to talk with you. And I, and I think it's funny, you get going and then you just warmed up and I feel like we could talk for hours now. So uh, Jeff Cools has one last question. Uh, if the shot is a tight single, oh, he's making a comment, that is not going to move. Oh, no, he is at, excuse me, let me rephrase. Jeff Cool says, one last question. If the shot is a tight single that is not going to move, would you consider setting up a C-stand and setting your boom pole on it above the talent? I would not. Uh, there's there's very basic reasons why. Um, like me now, I'm 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 talking into the 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 the, the microphone, and Mike Wynn can show you this better with his his setup. But if the character that you're booming does this, it turns their head, and your boom is right here, and he turns his head, it's gonna sound terrible. If you're on a pole, you can go with him and move that mic with him to stay out out in front. Mike can demonstrate you know now. The, the difference in talking into the microphone and not in the microphone, it's, it's a big difference. Yeah, that's really great. So I just want to say uh, thank you, everyone, uh, for joining us. Uh, I will do uh, everyone saying thank you, Charles, here on the, uh, you know, on the comments. I appreciate everyone, sure. everyone being here. Hope everyone stays safe and um, just, uh, you know, continues to be well during this time. And uh, if you like this video, hit that like button and stay posted for more uh, videos uh, from industry professionals here. Cause I've got this set up and you know, I'm going to continue to do this. So thank you, Charles. Let's do it again next week. If you have time. We can, okay. We can yeah. do it again. Absolutely. All right. Thank you, Charles. Sounds good. Bye.